Hi everybody, I'm Jack the Rambling Raconteur. I hope you're doing well. Uh, I want to do a discussion around The Autobiography of an Ex-Colored Man by James Weldon Johnson, who is an executive secretary of the NAACP, uh, part of the United States Foreign Service before that, uh, a successful novelist, admitted to the state bar in Florida during Jim Crow. And so, just a, a man who very much like been there, done that uh, as a human being, and you know, and and yet one of his uh, accomplishments was writing this extraordinary short novel. It's about 160 pages, and it's t it's fictional. And it's titled Autobiography of an Ex-Colored Man. It really is a it's many things. It's a building's Roman in a in a in a way where it's you know tracing the development of this uh, youth, adolescent, and ultimately young man into his manhood. Uh, but it's also a social novel um, without being like overbearing in any way. Uh, it, in fact, you can tell there are places where Johnson is almost like pulling back uh, and, and trying to keep it from being too much and too obviously a social novel. But it's also this, it's weirdly pitched um, in the mode of the confessions of St. Augustine or of uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, where he's sort of like, I'm going to divulge the, these all of these ideas I've been having in my head, you know, I'm going to divulge my individual psychology, my, my, not just, you know, sort of my life, but my head space, my heart space. Um, and of course it's fictional. So he's creating a character who is not James Weldon Johnson. Uh, the character is unnamed and it, it very emphatically is not James Weldon Johnson. As I said, his own uh, biography was that of a man who was very open, open about, you know, who he was, uh, where he came from and what he was doing with his life of, of trying to be part of, you know, uh, of the social movement, uh, combating racism, combating segregation. And, and he was ex he truly excelled at that. Um, but the, the book itself is really fascinating. And it, um, as I said, it kind of acts as a building Roman. It's interesting because it's almost like a, uh, a necklace with a bunch of extraordinary gems on it where you can look at each gem within the necklace and like analyze that and like, wow, that's a beautiful gem. And yet when you see the whole piece, the whole piece, you know, with all of the gems, it becomes so much more than any, like how brilliant any one individual gem is. And so that's kind of how the novel works. There are these little gems, there's his boyhood. Um, and then uh, this period of time where he's going to school and he doesn't even realize he's black. Uh, his father is, is, is a wealthy white Southerner. Um, and so he, he has no idea while living in Connecticut in the North that he would be considered, you know, non-white. And yet when he finds that out, he, he discovers this like deep sense of shame overcomes him. Uh, but from there he starts to advance and he tells his mother at one point um, that he goes, uh, I could talk of nothing else with my mother except my ambitions to be a great man, a great colored man, to reflect credit on the race and gain fame for myself. It was not until years after that I formulated a definite and feasible plan for realizing my dreams. Uh, and so that, there's like that gem. Then there's this gem of his musical development. And from there he goes uh, to college, to Atlanta University, which is where James Weldon Johnson went to school. Um, but again, not, this is not an actual autobiography. It's important to remember that. He goes there. He goes to Jacksonville, where Johnson grew up and later was uh, successful. For a time, Jacksonville was one of the few cities that wasn't overwhelmed by segregation early on, and gradually became overwhelmed by segregation. Um, and the Jim Crow laws were strictly enforced there, as in you know throughout the rest of the uh, southern southeastern United States. And um, and so, like we have all these different pieces. Uh, he's you know moderately successful in Jacksonville. He apprentices to learn to become a uh, a uh, roller of cigars, and then because he's literate, becomes the reader for the factory, and so he, he gets paid to read out loud and tell stories, which he thinks is great. But ultimately, he goes to New York, and this is where we, we have uh, one of, to my mind, the two sections that are really, really uh, interesting and sort of fascinating within the book. It, it's the gem that like you could like cut it out of the necklace and put it in an anthology of short stories, and it would be one of the best short stories in there. And it opens with this passage about uh, New York. The last efforts of the sun were being put forth in turning the waters of the bay to glistening gold. The green islands on either side, in spite of their warlike mountings, looked calm and peaceful. The buildings of the city shone out in a reflected light which gave the city an air of enchantment. And truly, it is an enchanted spot. 
New York City is the most fatally fascinating thing in America. She sits like a great witch at the gate of the country, showing her alluring white face and hiding her crooked hands and feet under the folds of her wide garments, constantly enticing thousands from far within and tempting those who come across the seas to go no farther. And all these become the victims of her caprice. Some she at once crushes beneath her cruel feet, others she condemns to a fate like that of galley slaves. A few she favors and fondles, riding them high on the bubbles of fortune. Then with a sudden breath she blows the bubbles out and laughs mockingly as she watches them fall. And <laughs> what a great like chapter opener. And th th there's about two chapters set in New York City, uh, sort of at the turn of the century. And it's, it's almost this like a uh, Gilded Age Harlem Renaissance mashup. It's really extraordinary. Uh, the, the book itself, of course, predates the Harlem Renaissance by more than a decade. Um, and uh, James Weldon Johnson was, you know, in his real actual professional life later on, helped, uh, you know, advance some of those artists during the Harlem Renaissance. Um, but, but the book itself was written well before that. And you, you just, it, the scenes that we get are fascinating. They're full of energy, vitality. Uh, we see this character, you know, the, the unnamed narrator, learning to play craps. He's gambling. He's, uh, you know, living this, this life that feels very much of the Roaring Twenties or of the Gilded Age. It reminds me in some ways of, of uh, the shades of the nightlife, the Parisian nightlife that come through in some of Guy de Maupassant's uh, short stories. And it's really fascinating. There's a scene of incredible violence that's surprising. We, uh, and and it's it just, as a whole, those two chapters just have this different energy from the sort of Buildings Roman, you know, autobiography, almost like David Copperfield type stuff that's been going on before that. And then uh, after the violent denouement, we have another shift. And the next gemstone is set in uh, Europe as uh, the narrator travels with a, a wealthy white benefactor who had, while he was in New York, periodically contracted him to come out and play ragtime. Uh, but he could also play classical music, but he would play classical music and then ragtime at uh, parties this man threw. And so they go and travel through Europe and ultimately he decides, you know, he, he has said he wants to be a, a credit to, uh, to his race and this great individual. And so his goal is going to become to take uh, the different folk songs and spiritual songs uh, that were sung by slaves and are, were still, you know, being sung by uh, workers across the southern United States. And he's going to, you know, transcribe all of those notes. And that's going to be his mission. So he goes back uh, and he's, it seems like things are going well. He's kind of moving this uh, higher level of, um, of society among other African Americans. Despite Jim Crow, he's able to, you know, stay with physicians or uh, professors or, you know, teachers, things like that. And um, there's always this weird detached look the narrator has about seeing like rural African Americans uh, from, from that time. And he, he has a sense of superiority to, to them. But he, what ultimately um, breaks him is this horrifying scene of an actual lynching. And this is one like it's described in enough graphic detail. It, it, it really is quite horrifying um, and, and something that, you know, was happening was happening decades after this book was published in 1912 um but that ultimately makes the narrator decide because he is light enough his, his skin is light enough he's going to begin to pass as a white man and that he says he he feels shame you know that uh that other you know other people other african americans can be treated worse than animals and shame that he lives in a country that would treat them worse than animals and he points out that you know there are laws against torturing an animal and burning it alive and yet lynching is allowed and in real life James Weldon Johnson uh, as an advocate pushed very hard for an anti-lynching bill uh, throughout the 1920s which passed the US House uh, but was never brought to a vote in the Senate um, and so he, he this is something that you know as an adult he concerned him and then later on in his professional life he constantly was fighting against and working against. Uh, and so it ends with this really strange twist where because, you know, and it goes with the title, Autobiography of an Ex-Colored Man, he is saying, uh, I, you know, I'm narrating this entire story and I'm, he opens it with, I'm going to tell you this big secret that I'm, you know, I, <laughs> I've lived as an adult for all these years. I have these kids who are all regarded as white and I'm regarded as white. But in reality, this has been my experience. 
Um, and so he, we do have this really poignant moment where he, you know, living as a white man in New York City again, uh, falls in love and ultimately tells, you know, this, this woman that he loves who's white, you know, he confesses to her this, again, the confession, this whole history of his life. And in a sense, it's almost like there's a, there's a sense in which the autobiography is perhaps what he told her. Uh, and she, of course, um, there were, at the time, there were laws against uh, interracial marriage in numerous states within the United States, and that would persist well after this book was published for more than another 50 years. Um, and so he uh, tells this to her, and she is quite frightened, but ultimately they, you know, rekindle their affection. They end up married, they have two children together, and he has, you know, so there, there is this sense of hope within the book, but he allows this inward self-criticism. And again, it's not Johnson himself criticizing himself, but it's this narrator who's created who uh, t talks at the end about, you know, I'm, I'm successful, I'm wealthy, I've, I, I live as a upper middle class white man. And yet when I go and attend something where I see Booker T. Washington and I see, you know, the Jubilee Singers from Fisk University and I see how people are fighting for this, I realize that what I surrendered was, you know, in order for this comfort and the security, what I surrendered was the chance to like make a nation and, 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 and make a race is kind of the way he rephrases it. And so it really is an extraordinary book. It's one that um, I intend to reread. I had read other works by uh, Johnson, specifically uh, his, he had an interesting piece where he took uh, free verse and fashioned sermons in free verse. Uh, and it, they were published as God's trombones. And so I'm familiar, I was familiar with that work. But this is one that just has such a level of simultaneous interiority and detachment, and then has these exquisite like set piece chapters uh, stitched together. And, and, and it really does create a work that is, um, it's thought provoking and challenging, <clears throat> while also being just very well written. So I highly recommend it. Um, some other works that I was reminded of, uh, one would have been um, Zora Neale Hurston's uh, folklore collections, because she, in a sense, sort of did what the narrator of, um, of Johnson's autobiography claimed he was going to try and do. She went and collected all of the folklore from the rural uh, southeastern United States. Um, and so that's something I'm probably going to read that uh, in full in February. Uh, the Harlem Renaissance Reader has a huge number of works that, you know, including those by Johnson, including God's Trombones, but many other works uh, that fit in well with, with uh, his thinking. Charles Chestnut is in some ways a forerunner of Johnson. Um, specifically, the Conjure Tales are, are doing what, you know, Johnson sort of um, had his narrator trying to do. But Chestnut also wrote, you know, social novels and novels that dealt very seriously with uh, the concept of individuals who who had you know ancestors who were white and ancestors who were black and what that meant for their identity uh, and their lives in the United States. I mentioned, of course, that there's like the New York scenes, particularly, really feel like something you know um, some of the finer moments in Guy de Maupassant. Uh, but other works that came to mind were, of course, Passing by Nella Larson, just an extraordinary book. Um, written about 20 years later, but uh, showing a, a very different side of the very same theme Johnson is presenting in the autobiography. Uh, Victor Laval's Ballad of Black Tom has a character who is hired as the narrator to play music for a wealthy white individual and, and like primarily white audiences. And uh, I had not read the autobiography when I read this last year, but I, I definitely feel like Laval had read it. Um, there's some cool similarities there. I, I feel like there's an homage going on. Uh, Claude McKay was a, a sort of late contemporary of Johnson's and a, a member of the Harlem Renaissance in full. And his romance of Marseille is set primarily in Europe and uh, while with a very different social milieu from uh, the European chapters in autobiography, uh, there is this sense of, of both of them um, having a, a, a more global and more cosmopolitan view uh, than sometimes we think of, of many writers, you know, from that era having. Uh, I've mentioned, of course, the Confessions of St. Augustine. And then what might be one of the greatest novels, not only of the 20th century or of the United States in the 20th century, but Invisible Man by Ralph Ellison, 
very much, uh, I think, takes Johnson's some of Johnson's ideas, and you know, with him, it it was this concept of passing as white. With Ralph Ellison, it becomes almost this concept of becoming invisible, and how can you know, uh, uh, if society can be that dangerous, what does it mean to to sort of remove some, oneself from society and take the detachment of, of Johnson's narrator to a much greater degree. And, and I think that's one of the things Ellison captures magnificently in Invisible Man. So I don't know if you've, uh, if you've ever read James Weldon Johnson. I highly, highly recommend it. Um, his brilliant song, Lift Every Voice and Sing, is, is justifiably famous. Um, and uh, here in the United States, of course, tomorrow is Martin Luther King Day. Uh, and last year I did a video on the, um, I, I uh, I've been to the mountaintop sermon. And uh, so I'll link that video in, in, in the description notes. It's a great, great sermon, great text. So thanks everybody.